All right, so ladies and gentlemen, remember yesterday we finished up unit one for pre-calc. Okay, so yesterday, like I said, we finished up that unit, so you should have been able to take your test. All right, now, I'm only able to unlock your tests uh, if you start the course, all right? So if you haven't started the course, I can't uh, unlock your test for you. So um, please, again, like I said, make sure you're trying to keep up with that because uh, um, the pace that we're setting right now, uh, two classes, or sorry, two lessons a day, uh, at least for pre-calc, that's, that's the pace that we're gonna keep um, throughout this entire three weeks here, okay? Um, so again, I don't want you to get caught behind you do have time to make it up so uh you you don't need to freak out but again it's always better to stay on top of things as it comes uh available all right so today what we're gonna do is we're going to go into unit two all right so we're gonna look at these trigonomic functions all right um and there are five lessons in this unit here. So again, we're gonna finish this up here. Uh, between today and tomorrow, we're gonna be able to finish this up and, and take that test. So uh, again, we have a lot more units, or not a lot more, we have one more unit um, in, in pre-calc than we do Algebra 2, but they are all shorter, okay? So we'll, we'll get into that. Um, so looking at trigonomic functions okay today we're going to cover 2.1 and 2.2 so you'll have two quizzes uh for those guys um if we look at our overview here just quickly um there are a lot of different different ways of looking at trigonomic functions so we've been looking at um we've been looking at these equations sine cosine tangent all of that stuff so we've been looking uh, at <coughs> apologies um we've been looking at the unit circle and how do we do those and how do we relate those those um those equations that we know or those principles that we know um so now we're actually going to look at what happens when we make them into a function how can we take something from being on this unit circle or just a a triangle by itself and how can we now make it into this repeating function all right, so first we're gonna look at the graphs of sine and cosine, right? We're, we're gonna start with, with sine and cosine. So looking here at our, um, uh, apologies, <clears throat> looking here at our overview, okay? So we've been dealing a lot with parent functions, right? We've been dealing a lot with parent functions, um, especially last semester, uh, and understanding what those look like. So. It's important to understand how we look at these different functions, okay? It's, it's important to understand how do we look at these functions and how do we, we talk about them graphically. So looking at this, remember if I say f of x, that's the function with the variable x included, all right? And f of x is, is going to be our output value of y. Right, so f of x is going to be our output value of y. So then when we're talking about um, our ordered pairs, okay, when we're talking about our ordered pairs, when we would write them, we would write them in obviously those, those notations of x then y, right? Or how they're showing it here, if you're writing it generally, you would write it as x comma f of x, because basically that's just saying x and then the output value y, which is a function of whatever you have for x. All right. Um, and, and when we're looking at these trigonomic functions, when we're looking at these trigonomic functions, especially uh, again with those six, six equations that we're, we're familiar with, um, when we're dealing with the graphs of sine and cosine, it's a part of this special family called sinusoidals. Okay, sinusoidals or sinusoidals, however you want to pronounce that. All right, they're called sinusoids. All right, and 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 so we're gonna look at how do we graph them? What are the major points in these different graphs, and 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 how do we use them moving forward? So obviously the question is is what is a sinusoid? All right, and, and they're based on the graphs of the trigonomic functions of sine and cosine, okay? They're based on the functions of sine and cosine, all right? Um, and they're used in ancient civilization, sure, right? Um, and they're used in Hindu mathematics, they're used in Greek mathematics, 
um, and, 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 and so on and so forth, okay? They've been used for a lot of different things. And when I show you what the shape of these graphs will look like, it'll make a lot of sense when we're talking about astronomical positions or light. Um, but uh, uh, again, the definition of this sinusoids are the family of curves based on the trigonomic function of sine and cosine, right? Sine, cosine. So when we're looking at graphing sine, okay, when we look at graphing sine, we got to relate it back to our unit circle. And our unit circle has a radius of one, right? So again, our circumference of a circle is two pi r. Well, if r is equal to one, like it does on a unit circle, we were able to then make right triangles. You're able to make right triangles based on this point p, okay? And then we were able to figure out that, hey, the x coordinate is equal to cosine of theta, and the y coordinate is equal to sine theta, right? So we're able to keep that as a, a general term there, all right? So we got to remember that our point here, x is equal to cosine and y is equal to sine. So again, if I was at this point, one, zero, I was at this point, one, zero, the cosine, <coughs> um, the cosine of that point, would be one, right? It would be the x coordinate and sine would be zero. Okay, sine would be zero. So we gotta remember that. So then what happens is, is then we can now look at going from just this circle here to actually putting this on one of our x, y coordinate planes and making a graph of what happens to sine itself. Because remember, a circle is just a repeating pattern. So this can go around multiple, multiple times. And so how would we look at that graphically, especially if we were looking at just what happens to sine itself? What happens to sine itself? Or another way of saying that is, is what happens to the y-coordinate? The values along the horizontal axis denote the angle formed by the radius containing the point and the positive x-axis. The vertical values of the graph denote the vertical placement of the point on the circle. In other words, the y-coordinates. Okay, so again, if you miss that, going around this circle, is like going on the x-axis, right? Because the x-axis here is theta, right? So the x-axis here is theta, all right? Hopefully you can notice that. And then our, our y here is denoting, again, our y-axis. So that one is staying the same. But when we're going from, again, circular to this x-y coordinate, okay, our, our x values here are our values of theta. So as- the point. Again, as this point is going around, right, we're traveling around theta. So one whole rotation would get us to two pi theta, right? And then again, going up and down, right, as we go up, this would be at y equals one, y equals zero, y equals one, y equals zero. And the positive x-axis. The vertical values of the graph denote the vertical placement of the point on the circle. In other words, the y coordinates. Take a look at the shape of the graph as it's generated from this definition. Okay, so as we go around our circle, again, it goes up, right? The y values go up as we travel along this circle. So hopefully I'll play that again. You're able to see that. As it's generated from this definition. Going down, 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 down as we travel along our X axes. And it's making hopefully something that is familiar to you, right? This kind of looks like um, the waves that were generated when we talked about wavelength, right? And the speed of light um, and, and, and all of that stuff, right? Amplitude, crest, all of that, right? So now you can kind of understand as to why they use this to talk about astronomy or, or the traveling of light, right? They, they use these kinds of shapes here because it's going to make these, these wavelength type shapes, all right? And these wavelength type shapes. And, and if we go forward here, 
uh, I guess what I can point out here is that down here, these were just numbers, right? One, two, three, four. It didn't say two pi, it just said two. But if we go and we actually now make our values in terms of pi, you'll be able to get a more, uh, I guess the word is crisp, right? I could say we'd get a more crisp looking um, graph in terms of matching things up from our unit circle to our our new x y um our new x y graph here all right so completing the table of values will give you a great chance to practice recalling the sign of some common angle measures okay so again if we were to actually go through this remember we have zero that sign of zero or the y coordinate when our theta equals zero was zero Right, and, and, and easily we should be able to pick out those four major points, right? Zero, pi over two, pi, uh, three pi over two, and two pi, right? Those are gonna be either zero, one, zero, or negative one, right? Those were our four major points on our unit circle, okay? Then again, using our, our, our middle reference points here, we can calculate those, and then obviously we could fill in the rest here. Complete the table, plotting each point <laughs> as you go. Okay, so again, you should be able to know at least the four major points of zero, pi over two, pi, and two pi, right? Because those, again, were our four major points where it was either at zero, positive one, Ne uh, zero or negative one in terms of the y coordinate. All right, and so when we do that, and then we plug in our our middle points here, um, based on on our reference points, right? We're able to generate this again wave like form for sine. You can extend your table of values beyond two pi or to the left of zero by filling in this table. Right, and so again, what you're gonna notice is it's just that repeating wave pattern. It's just the repeating wave pattern. Connect these points with a smooth curve to yield the graph of the sine function. Since you can continue the table of values indefinitely in either direction, the graph of the sine function continues beyond the viewing window. Its predictable shape with the hills and valleys, called waves, is an example of periodic behavior. This behavior repeats every two pi units along the x-axis. Right, so again, remembering that a unit circle is, is um, got a circumference of two pi. So once we reach two pi, all we do is we start back over. So again, if we notice, we start at the zero point, we go up to one, cross the zero, back down, and back up to zero. And then all it does is it repeats again, right? It repeats again, and that's why we call it one wavelength. Right, that's why we called it one wavelength. Um, okay, so, so this again should hopefully kind of look familiar, but now we know the mathematical equation for how to generate a graph of this shape, right? We could use uh, our sine function, right? Again, if we're starting at zero and then we go up to one, down to one, that, that's our, our, our sine function for our unit circle there, all right? Now, taking a closer look here, okay? So summary of our graph. So we know, again, we start at zero, we go up to one, back to zero, down, right? And it, it takes two pi to get back to where we started. Again, thinking of our unit circle, it takes two pi to get back to the original location, all right? So if we were to just highlight over this, okay? The domain of the sine function is all real values. So again, our x value, we have all real values. It can be any positive number or any negative number, right? It's gonna go on and on and on forever in both directions. But the range, right, our y values can only go from negative one to positive one, right? Again, our unit circle has a radius of one, so we can't go any higher or lower than an absolute value of one, okay? Now, <clears throat> the sine function is what we call odd. Okay, it's, uh, it's an odd function, okay? And that's a new term for us. So if I highlight over what it means by odd function, it means it is symmetric about the origin, 
okay? That means it has symmetry based on the origin. Okay, it has symmetry based on the origin. All right, or another way of saying that is f of negative x is the same thing as negative f of x, right? It is symmetric about the origin. The left side looks like the right side. Okay, except for it is reflected across the x-axis and the y-axis, right? It's, it's reflected across the x-axis and the y-axis. All right, so again, it's like taking this, flip it here, and then flip it down. That's what it means by odd function, because it is symmetric about the origin. <coughs> Our origin being at zero, zero. And if I highlight over what that means, okay, you can see all of these points. So what it's saying is, and I can't move without it um, getting rid of, but what it's saying is, is that you have similar points. They're the same distance away. They are just reflected across the X and the Y axes, or as we say, it's symmetric about the origin. All right, so again, those points match up. They're just reflected across the origin. All right, and then finally here, Sine function exhibits a periodic behavior, all right? So that's a new term again for us again. Periodic behavior, which means it repeats itself. It repeats itself, each period or each fragment, okay? So for us, it's repeating itself every two pi. So the period that it repeats itself with is two pi, all right? So it's showing you in blue and in red, okay, but basically it's showing you it's going from zero to two pi, two pi to four pi, four pi to six pi, right? Or even if I started at pi here, right? In order to get back to where I started, it's still one pi, two pi, right? So that's why it's flipping from red to blue. It doesn't matter if I start at the origin or if I'm starting at pi, I'm still gonna have that repeating periodic function and behavior, and it takes, again, two pi to get back to where I started. All right, so then looking at cosine now, looking at cosine, remember, cosine is our x values. Cosine is our x values. So now we're not looking at how high, we're looking at how far. Okay, so, All right, so now we're gonna look at, at cosine here. And, and, and cosine is going to do a, a similar thing here. So if we watch this. The values along the horizontal axis denote the angle <laughs> formed by the radius containing the point and the positive x axis. The vertical values of the graph denote the horizontal placement of the point on the circle. In other words, the x coordinates. Okay, so now, now it's different. So hopefully you heard that, okay? Now when it goes up and down for y, it's denoting our x coordinates. Because again, we're looking for cosine of x, or sorry, cosine of theta. And cosine of theta is our x values, right? So if we're trying to graph cosine, now we're not looking at y values on our coordinate or on our, um, sorry, on our unit circle. When we're looking at cosine, cosine of theta is equal to x. So when we plot it on this x, y coordinate, I know it's a little confusing, but our y coordinate here is going to be whatever cosine is, right? So whatever our x value is. Take a okay, so if we look here before it gets started, this coordinate here is at one zero. It's at one zero. So if we look at our, our unit circle, again, we're looking for our X coordinate. Well, our X coordinate for this first point is one. So if you notice here, our graph starts at one. And then when it gets to pi over two, when it gets to pi over two here, okay, when it gets to pi over two, it should go back to zero. 
and then it's going to go to negative one back to zero right because we're only looking at the x-axis so let's watch it starts at one a look at the shape of the graph as it's generated from this definition all right down there it's at negative one great when we get back to three pi over two it's back at zero right now when we come back to either two pi right when we come back to two pi we should go back up to one right because all we were looking at here was our x was our x value so again we started at one okay we went back to zero we went to negative one back to zero one to one back to zero right it's going to be this repeating repeating pattern okay and again our our now x position is still determined by how this goes around our unit circle right in terms of our pies so now again we could pick out like i said our major points zero pi over two pi three pi over two and and two pi right and we know that we're going to go from one to zero to negative one to zero Completing the table of values will give you a great chance to practice recalling the cosine of some common angle measures. Let's complete the table, plotting each point as we go. Right, and again, the values in between are the x values based on our reference angles, right? So th square root of three over two, one half, zero, right? All of those are based on our reference angles that we just dealt with in, in unit one there, okay? So then same thing here, since it's going to have that periodic you can behavior, extend the table. Oh, sorry, because it's going to have that periodic behavior, we can extend it to the left and to the right. The values beyond 2 pi or to the left of 0 by filling in this table. Okay, so same thing. You're going to be able to connect the dots. Connect these points with a smooth curve to yield the graph of the cosine function. Since you can continue the table of values indefinitely in either direction, the graph of the cosine function continues beyond our viewing window. This graph also exhibits periodic behavior. This behavior repeats every two pi units along the x-axis. Okay, so it's very, very, very similar to what happens with sine, except for the difference being that cosine starts at one but sine started at zero right cosine starts at one but sine starts at zero they still have a periodic behavior both of them they repeat every two pi right they both only ever go up to one and negative one right but the difference again being is where does that graph start at where does that graph start at okay <laughs> now another difference being that cosine is still a periodic function right it's still having that two pi behavior but now instead of being an odd function it's what we call an even function okay the odd function it was odd because it was reflected across, or uh, I'm sorry, it was symmetric about our origin, right? It was reflected across our y axis and our x axis. But now we call it an even function if it's just reflected across one axis. So, for example, it's symmetric across our y axis. They look like mirror images of each other. All right, so again, <clears throat> our summary of cosine. All real numbers, still any number you put in for your x uh, or our domain will still work. Okay, our range is still positive one to negative one. It's still got a behavior of, of, of um, a periodic behavior of two pi, right? It's going to repeat every two pi, but now again, it's symmetric across our y axis. So we call it an even function. We call it an even function when it's symmetric across our y axis. All right. Uh, perfect. Okay, so then looking at um, more of our functions, okay? And all trigonomic functions are going to be uh, uh, repeating or have this periodic nature to them, okay? But there's uh, obviously a lot more that goes on with that. So if we look at example one, 
okay? Example one here is still, oh, sorry. It's still a periodic function. It's repeating, right? It might not have that perfect, um, that perfect one, to one shape, right, where it goes up to one, down to one, but it's still a repeating pattern. Same thing here. Might be a triangle, okay? But it's still a repeating pattern. Obviously this one again, it's still a repeating pattern. It doesn't look as obvious, right? But you can notice that it starts, makes the vertical line at the top, makes the vertical line at the bottom, and then repeats, right? It repeats. Uh, something else I want to point out here too for this one, okay? Notice it does also repeat, or it also repeats if it's an open or closed circle, right? It repeats if it's an open or closed circle. That does matter, right? You can't have one with all open circles and one with all closed circles. It has to be consistent, right? In order to obviously be a repeating pattern. Any real number can serve as the period of a periodic function. Periodic functions can take on many forms and shapes. They can be smooth or jagged or even have jumps. The only requirement is that they repeat values periodically. Note that in each case, once the graph for one period is determined, you know what the graph of the function looks like for all values. The graph simply repeats. Okay. And, and this is the one that he was talking about jumps. So that gap between the points is what's known as a jump. And, we'll, and you'll learn more about that later on, okay? So then really what it boils down to is these things called the five essential points, all right? Once you're comfortable with knowing what the general shape of sine and cosine look like, you can actually just sketch these functions with, with these five points, okay? So you can sketch these with five points. So looking at it, again, it's, it's the first point. We know it goes up to one, it goes down to one, and it's gonna cross zero at multiple points there. So that, that's what makes up our five points, right? Our, our zeros, and then our min and our max. So if we look here, ooh, sorry. If you look here, we have two times sine of x. Okay, well, the first question is, okay, <coughs> we know, what <coughs> apologies um we know what the shape of sine of x should look like right we know what the shape of of, of sine of x should look like okay we have x as our independent variable and y is our dependent variable right again x is what we input uh y is our output okay our domain, our domain, that's our X values. So that's all real numbers, right? Again, all real numbers, it still applies for sine here, okay? The period of sine of X is still two pi, right? Sine of X has a period of two pi. That's how many, uh, how many, or sorry, how long it's gonna take to repeat or get back to the original point, it's still two pi. The only difference here, the only difference here between sine of x and two sine of x is that two out in front, okay? So all that's going to do is that's going to increase our range, okay? So our range is not gonna be negative one to one anymore. It's gonna be negative two to two, right? Our range is now gonna be negative two to two. That's the only thing that changes if we multiply by two. Right, we can still have our domain. We still have our period, still two pi. Right, the only thing that's different there is, is the absolute value of our range. Okay. <clears throat> so what we can do here now is we have our five major points. We have our five major points. So we know that for sine of x, for sine of x, when we start at zero, it's gonna be zero, right? And we know that we're going to cross again at two pi and again at pi, right? We know that. Oh, well, yes, I thought I was hoping it would uh, fill them in. Okay, so then we start at zero here, okay? We're gonna go up to two. 
Oh, curses. Let me back that up. Sorry. Okay. So we're starting at zero, zero, zero. Okay. We know we're going to go up to two at pi over two. We're going to come back down to zero at pi, and then we're going to go down to negative two. Right? We're going to go start at zero. We know that for sine. We know we end at two pi. We end at zero as well. And halfway in between, we have to change our sign. So we're going to have that third zero. Okay. And then, like we said, we know that our range is positive two to negative two. So we know we're going to start up, come down. All right. So then, if we were to plot, that's what it would look like. We could generally connect them with a smooth curve. And then we know that since it's periodic, we know that we could repeat over and over and over again, okay? And like we said, we know that our range is from negative two to two. We know that it has the periodic nature of two pi. We know we have all real numbers for our domain. And again, this function is still considered odd, all right? The function is odd. And again, the reason it's odd is because it is reflected across the x and the y axes, or it is symmetric about the origin, okay? So then just a quick note on notation here, all right? So the independent variable, like I said earlier, instead of it showing it as x, we showed it as theta, right? So so that way we could say uh, theta is equal to, or I'm sorry, our output of sine of theta and then theta, all right? We could also say x and sine of x, all right? So, so kind of whatever makes sense to you, but when we're talking about, we're talking about things in terms of radians, it's easier to refer to your x axes as theta because then you can write it as two pi, right? And, and pi and pi over two and all of that stuff. All right, so that's just a quick, quick note there um, in case that was any, uh, anyone was confused there. All right, so then look, if we look here and just review, okay, a couple quick things here. So noticing, one, it has a repeating pattern. That's, that's the first thing you should notice. It repeats about two pi, okay? So great, we're dealing with sine and cosine here. All right, it's starting at the origin, it's starting at zero and it's, it looks like it's symmetric about the origin. So that means we're dealing with the function of sine. All right. And then our range goes from four to negative four. So clearly we had to multiply by a factor of four. So that makes this graph four sine of X, right? Four sine of X. If I look here again, repeating pattern. Uh, every two pi. But now instead of starting at zero, I started at two and I'm symmetric about my y axes. So I'm dealing with an even function. I'm dealing with an even function. It's symmetric about my y axes. Okay, so that means I'm dealing with cosine. And since my domain is all real values and my range goes from two to negative two, I've multiplied by a factor of two there. All right. Lastly here, if we look, we can see that now we don't have a period of two pi, okay? We don't have a period of two pi because what we do is we look to see, okay, if I'm starting at zero, how long does it take me to get back to that point, right? So this period is actually just pi, right? took me pi, 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 all right? So you can have things that don't have a period of two pi. All right, so then quickly here, looking at our study guide, all right, looking at our study guide, we were dealing with the graphs of cosine and sine, um, and those are, are, are the trigonomic functions, right? Uh, and those are called sinusoids, right? It's part of a family called sinusoids, all right? If we look at sine, okay, again, sine starts at zero, it goes up to one, down to negative one, and it repeats every two pi, all right? Domain is all real numbers, it goes from negative one to positive one, and it's what we call an odd function because it's symmetric about the origin. For cosine, Cosine starts at one, 
still goes through zero, negative one, uh, and back up, and it still repeats every two pi, but again, the difference being that this is an even function because it's reflected across the y-axis, or sy symmetric about the y-axis, okay? <coughs> So then this one's saying, draw a periodic function other than sine or cosine, right? We, we saw two examples of those, right? Or sorry, three examples. We saw one that maybe kind of looked like sine, but wasn't as symmetric. Okay, we saw one with a jagged V shapes. And then we saw one where it made a bunch of jumps. Here's another example, okay? Here's another example. It looks like uh, a repeating x cubed function. It looks like a repeating x cubed function, if you remember what the parent function for that looks like. Okay, um, so then again here, we went through this example, but just remembering that you look at the base function and then see if there's any changes, right? So the only difference there was that we multiplied our range by two. Okay, we multiplied our range by two. Here, again, noticing it's repeating every two pi, it starts at the origin, so we're dealing with a sine function. And then it goes up to a value of three. So that now makes that three sine of x. All right. So then just a quick couple notes here on our checkup. Quick couple notes on our checkup to help you. All right. For negative cosine of x, right? It literally tells you take its opposite. All right. So if cosine of x is equal to one, or I'm sorry, um, at zero, when cosine of x was equal to 1, negative cosine would be equal to negative 1, right? So normally this would start at 1, okay, and it would go down. If you have negative cosine of x, you start at negative 1, okay? You start at negative 1. For this one here, we have sine of x plus 1. So hint there is find the value of sine, then add 1. So again, normally, normally, sine, okay, normally sine of x would start at zero. Sine of x would start at zero, okay, but now we're going to add one. So we shift up, okay, we shift up. All right, and then we should be able to figure out the domain and range using, um, using our table of values, okay? It shouldn't hopefully be any, any different. Okay, uh, and the only thing that might be a, a little bit tricky here is, is this quest question six. Using the definition of odd and even function, explain why sine of x plus one is neither odd nor even. So if we look at this graph here, okay, in order to be an even function, it has to be symmetric across the y-axis. And since this one goes up and this one goes down, it is not an um, it is not an even function, all right? And to be an odd function, it has to be symmetric about the origin, and the origin is right here at zero, zero. Well, obviously, it's not symmetric across the origin because that would mean that this point here would be a point down there. So since it's not symmetric across that, it is not an, an odd function either. Okay, so that would be what that's saying. And, and this, this is again a, a, a wordy, a more wordy way, uh, I'm sorry, a, a, more, um, a, a, a more mathematically expressed way of saying the same thing that I just said in, in words there, okay? <coughs> and they, they show that using um, different functions, showing that they're not the same values. Okay, so for 2.1, you have this one quiz here. Hopefully it's not too terrible, right? It's just the graphs of sine and cosine. All right, then when we look here, we can look at graphs of other functions, right? So we can look at graphs of other trigonomic functions, right? So we just dealt a lot with sine and cosine, and you know that there are also four other identities that we've been dealing a lot with. Like, for example, tangent right? We can look at what tangent might look like. And we know that tangent is sine divided by cosine. 
sorry, we know that tangent is sine divided by cosine, which is y divided by x, right? We know it's y divided by x, okay? So if we watch this video here, what it's going to do is, again, it's going to start with, or I would start with, your four major points, your zero, your pi over two, your pi and pi, uh, three pi over two, right? And I would look at what happens when I have my y and my x values. Okay, what happens there? And this video will explain it a little bit more in detail. As with the sine and cosine functions, the tangent function can be graphed on a standard set of axes. Complete the table, plotting each point as you go. You can also graph the negative values of- Okay, and, and before it gets there, what I wanna point out is, is look. Sorry. Um, I have two vertical asthmatopes here. Right, what I can notice is, is between, between zero and two pi, okay, between zero and two pi, I have two vertical asthmatopes. And you might be asking the question, why do I have two vertical asthmatopes? Well, that would be wherever I'm dividing by zero, right? Because if I divide by zero, that makes my function undefined. So again, if I'm looking for where x is equal to zero, it's gonna be, at pi over two and at three pi over two. And lo and behold, that's where I have my vertical asthmatopes, right? Pi over two and three pi over two. Something else you can notice here, I have one, two, three zeros, right? I have three zeros because again, that's where the top value is going to be zero. So if I look here at my, my zero here, one, or I'm sorry, zero divided by one is gonna be zero. Over here, zero divided by negative one is still gonna be zero. And then back around, zero divided by one, gonna be one, uh, zero. All right, and then the values in between, <coughs> I could use my reference angles, um, knowing what my X and my Y values are and plug those guys in, which is what they did. Angle theta for this function. Finally, these points can be connected with a smooth curve to show you the complete shape of the function. As you Okay, so look, they combined those, and we just talked about it in, in Algebra 2. But remember, those vertical asthmatopes, so it's going to get close but never cross, close but never cross. So it looks like, again, a repeating pattern. Um, and, and again, where it crosses the x-axis, but it's not crossing those vertical asthmatopes. You can see it has a very different shape from the sine and cosine <laughs> functions. Since the table of values can be continued indefinitely, the tangent function continues beyond this viewing window. This graph, like the sine and cosine functions, exhibits periodic behavior because the shape repeats regularly. However, unlike the sine and cosine functions, the tangent function has a period of pi instead of 2 pi. Okay, I'm sorry, it won't, it, it, it's a video, so it won't let me scroll. Uh, there, there they go, all right? But you can see there that it's repeating every pi units, okay? And, and what you can notice two things. You can look at how long it takes the vertical asthmatopes to repeat, or you can look at where it crosses the x axis at pi, two pi, three pi. So this one has a period of just normal one pi. All right, so then if we summarize everything we just talked about, okay, so this is the general shape of what tangent of, of uh, theta looks like, okay, when we're plotting our x-axis as theta, all right? Now, there is a difference here, okay? Obviously, there's a lot of differences, all right? The first one, it exhibits a periodic behavior of pi, right? It repeats every pi units, all right? The tangent function is odd, okay? The tangent function is odd because it repeats, I'm sorry, it is symmetric across the origin, okay? It is symmetric across the origin because if you look here, right, I go down and over, up and over, right? It's symmetric across that origin, right? Symmetric across the origin. <coughs> 
all right? If I look at my range, okay, that's my Y values. So this is gonna keep going forever and ever and ever. It's gonna get really, really close to this line here, but it's never gonna touch this line of pi over two or negative pi over two, right? So these values for the range are now all real numbers, any real number, okay? And the domain is now what is limited. Our domain, our X values. Our X values cannot be pi over two, plus or minus pi. So what that's saying is, is it can't be pi over two plus or minus N pi, which means N is a real number, right? So I can't have something at pi over two, that would be here. If n is one, <laughs> one plus pi over two, that gives me three pi over two. If I have n is two, that gives me four pi over, or sorry, five pi over two, right? So what it's saying is, is every pi over two, there's going to be an asymptote. All right, uh, repeating as a, a uh, period of pi. Okay, so now what we can do is we can look at cotangent, cotangent. So might look similar here, except for again, now we have cosine over sine. So our X over Y, all right, our X over Y. So again, we're still gonna look for where do we have our zeros and where is our graph going to be undefined? Those are gonna be our defining characteristics of our graph. So taking a look here. As with the other trigonometric functions, the cotangent function can be graphed on a standard set of axes. Complete the table, plotting each point as you go. All right, and again, hopefully you're able to notice that now instead of having two vertical asymptotes and three zeros like we did with tangent, those are now flipped. We have three vertical asymptotes and two zeros, right? So effectively, we've just flipped. So everywhere there was a zero, there's now a asymptote, and everywhere there was an asymptote, there's now a zero. You can also graph the negative values of angle theta for this function. Finally, these points can be connected with a smooth curve to show you the complete shape of the function. As you can see, it has a very similar shape to the tangent function. Since the table of values can be continued in either direction, the cotangent function <laughs> continues beyond this window. This graph, like the other trigonometric functions you've seen, exhibits periodic behavior. As with the tangent function, cotangent has a period of pi radians. Okay, so it's gonna look similar, but Obviously, some slight differences here. Obviously, some slight differences. Okay, so, oh, sorry, I gotta zoom out there. If I zoom back out here, all right. Again, this is still exhibiting a period of pi, right? It repeats every pi units, okay? It is still an odd function, okay? It's still an odd function because it's symmetric about our origin. All right, it's symmetric about the origin. All right, the range is still all real numbers, okay? The only difference here is, is our domain, instead of being at, at intervals of pi over two, it's now at intervals of pi, right? It's now at intervals at pi, okay? So this one, again, where it started as a vertical asymptote, this one is, uh, th as this one starts as a vertical asymptote, our tangent started as a zero, okay? They both have similar shapes, but knowing those slight differences here. <coughs> okay, so now we can look at plotting secant and cosecant. We can look at plotting secant and cosecant. Right, so secant, secant is one over cosine, right? Or one over X. So what we can do is we can take the reciprocal of our cosine function. We can take the reciprocal of our cosine function, all right? 
and, and you might not know what that looks like right off the bat. So let's let's watch this video here. As with the other trigonometric functions, the secant function can be graphed on a standard set of axes. Complete the table, plotting each point as you go. You can also graph the negative values of angle theta for this function. Okay, so hopefully you've noticed this doesn't look like what our cosine function looked like. Now we have asymptotes and it looks like we have jumps, okay? So keep in your head, why would we do this? Okay? What makes a vertical asthmatope? What makes a vertical asthmatope? Finally, these points can be connected with a smooth curve to show you the complete shape of the function. As you can see, it has a very different shape from the previous trigonometric functions you've seen. Since the table of values can be continued in either direction, the secant function continues beyond this window. This graph, like the other trigonometric functions you've seen, exhibits periodic behavior. In this case, as with the sine and cosine functions, the period is 2 pi. Okay. So. This graph, like the other trigonometric okay. functions, as with the sine and cosine functions, the period is 2 pi. Let me see if I can get it to. All right. So. If we look at our origin here, all right, for cosine, for cosine, remember, cosine started at one. It started at one and it went down to zero, down to negative one, back on up, right? And if you remember that in order to get a vertical asymptote, you have to divide by zero, right? Make that function undefined. So if we think back, again, like I just said, at this interval here, at this interval, this would be where cosine would equal zero. Well, now remember, secant is one over cosine. So now I'm taking one divided by zero, right? And that, that's how we get this new shape of our graph here. We have one divided by whatever our answer was, okay? So now, looking at this here, okay, looking at this, it still has a periodic behavior. Okay, it still has a periodic behavior. Still 2 pi. Okay, it's still 2 pi. And it's still symmetric across the y axis, right? Just like cosine was. Okay, it's still symmetric about the y axis. So that makes it our even function. Right? It, just like cosine, it's still even. All right, but now our domain and range are gonna be different, right? Our range is from negative one to negative infinity or one to infinity, right? It's never gonna cross this middle region here. So how we write that is we say from negative infinity to negative one, that U is like an and sign, okay? You'll learn more about that later, um, especially in your, your calculus. But that U means and, right? It's a union. So and from one to positive infinity. From one to positive infinity. And remember, it is that bracket because both one and negative one are found on the graphs, right? Those values are included, so it's a bracket. All right. And then again, the domain is all real values except for where we have our vertical asymptotes, right? So our vertical asymptotes are at intervals of pi over two. So pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two, right? So that's, that's what that one is saying again. All right. And then finally here, cosecant, that's one over sine, all right? So again, think about it. We already know that sine's going to cross um, at x equals zero at some point, right? Sine will have a zero value, so we know we can't divide by zero, so this cosecant is gonna have those asymptotes as well. As with the other trigonometric functions, the cosecant function can be graphed on a standard set of axes. Complete the table, plotting each point as you go. <coughs> you can 
can also graph the negative values of angle theta for this function. Finally, these points can be connected with a smooth curve to show you the complete shape of the function. As you can see, it is very similar shape to the secant function, just offset by pi over 2. Since the table of values can be continued in either direction, the cosecant function continues beyond this window. This graph, like the other trigonometric functions you've seen, exhibits periodic behavior. In this case, as with the secant function, the period is 2 pi. So, again, noticing it's going to have a similar shape to what the um, secant had, but it's going to be offset by a couple things. All right. So, again, it still has vertical asymptotes, still has those vertical asymptotes, but now those vertical asymptotes are going to be at intervals of pi, right? They're going to be at intervals of pi. Our range is still going to be the same. Right, it's still going to be from negative infinity to negative one and one to positive infinity. All right. It's still going to have that periodic behavior of repeating every two pi. All right. And then finally, the cosecant function is going to be similar to our sine function, where it is odd because it has symmetric about our origin. It has symmetric about our origin. All right. So again, a couple of highlights here. Um, looking at the <coughs> the graphs here. Okay, again, I kind of walked you through this already, but graphing from sine and cosine, right? In my opinion, and, and apparently a lot of other people's opinions, sine and cosine are the easiest ones to remember, right? They're the easiest ones to remember. So we can always relate things back to what we know, right? And if we know cosine and sine, and we know those behaviors, we can then figure out the rest of it based on those, right? So again, if secant is one over cosine, okay, one over cosine, we look at our cosine function here, all right? We know that if cosine of zero, or sorry, if cosine of theta is equal to zero, when we take one divided by zero, that's going to be undefined. So everywhere where it crosses that zero axis is actually going to be a vertical asymptote. All right, so you can draw that by putting vertical asymptotes in all the places where cosine of theta is equal to zero. All right, and what we can also tell is, is that at every place where it's equal to one, one divided by one is going to give us one. All right, and similarly, one divided by negative one is going to give us negative one. So we know those points are what they are, right? And then you can tell whether the function is going to be positive or negative based on the sine of cosine, right? If cosine is positive, then positive divided by positive is going to give me a positive. If it's negative, then it's going to be a negative value as well, right? Then again, you have a pretty decent idea of what the, the, the graph's going to look like based on that, right? And again, hopefully you can remember it's just going to be a bunch of parabolas. And knowing those basic things that we just walked through, you can generally sketch what this graph would look like. Okay. And this is saying you can go through this exact same process for the cosecant function, right? Because that's just one over sine. If we look at tangent, okay, we can, we can look at tangent by looking at the graphs of sine and cosine. All right, so starting there, that's going to be our cosine. All right, so again, if cosine of theta is equal to zero, that makes it undefined. So anywhere where cosine is equal to zero is going to be an undefined. So we're going to have a vertical asymptote there. All right. If the top part, if sine is equal to zero, that's where we're going to cross our x-axis, right? That's where we're going to cross our x-axis because the zero on top gives us zero values, all right? So now we know that everywhere where sine crosses is going to be a zero value, okay? And now you're going to have to ask yourself, where are things positive and where are things negative? <coughs> And in order to do that, we can look at 
both the sines of cosine and um, sine. All right. So if they have the same sign, right, like right here, they're both positive. Okay. Then it's going to be a positive value. If one, if they're both negative, then it's going to be negative values. All right. And whenever the cosine and sine functions have opposite signs, the functions will be negative. All right. So again, if they have the same signs, right, if they have the same sign, let me try to go back there, right? Okay, if they have the same sign, so they're both positive or they're both negative, okay? They're both, if, if they're the same sign, they're going to be positive, all right? So even where it, it's this negative here, all right? It's going to be positive, because again, you're dividing. So if I divide a negative by a negative, that's gonna give me a positive value, all right? When those signs are opposite is when you're gonna have negative values, all right? So then, Based on this, we can generally sketch, we know that this is gonna be negative, we know that it's gonna cross here, and then this becomes positive, right? We know that there's two vertical asymptotes on either side, so we can, again, generally sketch the shape of the graph, all right? And we can walk through this same process here for cotangent, for cotangent, right? Again, walking through what sine and cosine would look like and what that means, all right? So if you'd like, you can do this. You don't have to, okay? Um, but there, there uh, are a bunch of handy tricks here and, and things that you can write down, um, but there are a lot of similarities. So if we look here. Fold the paper in half lengthwise. Unfold the paper and fold it in half in the other direction. <coughs> Unfold the paper. Fold the ends in until they meet at the middle crease. Cut the flap so that you have four flaps opening from the center outward, revealing four rectangles inside. Write the name of the four functions on the outside of each flap. On the underside of each flap, write the domain and range, as well as any other information you think is helpful. On the inner rectangle that is revealed behind the flap, sketch the graph of the function. Okay, so that, that could be a really helpful thing for you um, if, if you'd like. So that's just an example of what they, um, they suggest that you could do. All right. Um, looking at our study guide here. Are you looking at our study guide? Uh, again, hopefully not too difficult. It's pointing out the major components right, like zeros and vertical asymptotes for these last guys here. And then the, the periodic nature, how often do you need to repeat them, okay? So once you've got that, you can pretty much figure out the rest of this, right? You can figure out if it's odd, if it's even, what's its range, what's its domain, what's the general shape, right? So, so, so those are the main things. And if you were gonna make that flap, right, the, the little foldable that they talked about, all of this information here is what I would include or it's the information that was on those summary pages, okay? Um, um, and then here, these are those, those reminders. So if cosine of zero is equal to, or sorry, if cosine of theta is equal to zero, that means secant is undefined, right? The same thing goes for sine and, and, and uh, secant. Okay, um, if, if one is zero, right, and, and in the new equation, it's on the bottom. If it's on zero on the bottom, it's undefined. If it's a zero on top, then that means it's an actual zero. Okay. <coughs> looking at our checkup here. All right, looking at our checkup. All right, so again, you can find uh, the, the four major values, in my opinion, and then from there, you can use your reference angles to fill in the rest, okay? Um, and if we look here, 
negative cotangent, right? It's the same thing. You figure out what the values of cotangent are, and then you take its opposite or negative, or you have the negative sign. All right, for secant, right? For secant, same thing. You find the answer, then you add one. So our secant values normally would start at one. They're starting at two. Down here, they would normally start at negative one. Now they're starting at zero. So it's just a shift in the entire graph upwards of one. It's just a shift in the entire graph upwards of one. Okay. Uh, and then again, like we saw earlier, if I have a two here and I multiply by two, all I'm doing is, is doubling some of those values here. So normally when this would be a one, it's now a two. Right, normally when something's a one, it's now a two. Um, and this is not maybe the easiest graph for, for you to see that, but um, not, not a huge deal here. All right. So that is, is what we've got for our checkup, okay? And you have your 2.23 quiz. Okay, so you've got two quizzes today, 2.1 and 2.2. All right, 2.1 and 2.2. And then, like I said, what we're going to do tomorrow is cover 2.3, 2.4, and we'll get to this 2.5 wrap-up. So again, we'll finish unit two um, tomorrow here. Okay, we're going to finish unit two tomorrow here.